Hello, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Karen Kassler, Ohio State House News Bureau Chief. It's October 19th, and you are with a virtual City Club Forum. This month, the Ohio Debate Commission organized a virtual event with the four candidates for seats on the Supreme Court of Ohio. During that event, those candidates, incumbent Justices Sharon Kennedy and Judy French of the Ohio Supreme Court, and their challengers, jo Judge John P. O'Donnell of the Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Court, and Judge Jennifer Bruner of the Ohio 10th District Court of Appeals, discussed their views on issues on their role on the judicial and its relationship to other branches of government, judicial restraint, and activism, and ethics. Today, we'll break down the content of that forum and also discuss the future of the Ohio Supreme Court with three distinguished judges. Joining us today are the Honorable Ron Adrian. He is jurist in residence at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law and retired judge on the Cleveland Municipal Court. The Honorable Yvette McGee Brown. She's a partner at Jones Day and the 153rd Justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio. And the Honorable Judith Lanziger, the 150th Justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio. Welcome to all of you. As in every City Club forum, you can participate with your questions. You can text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet at the City Club and we will work them in. If you have any questions for our judges, go ahead and do that. But right now, let's just go ahead and get started with my questions for our distinguished panel here. First of all, for people who did watch the forum, and I encourage you to watch this forum that was put together by the Ohio Debate Commission, it was a, an interesting opportunity to sit down with all four candidates virtually. <laughs> uh, one question, though, people might have is why didn't I and my co-anchor, my co-moderator, uh, uh, Curtis Jackson from Spectrum News, why didn't we ask the justices about things like how they felt about home rule, about abortion, gun laws, the death penalty. Why didn't we do that? And uh, I'll, I'll start with whoever wants to start. How about you, Judge Adrian? Ron, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Uh, and thank you, Yvette. What I started to say was that uh, judges are really constrained as to what they can actually talk about in forums such as the one that was put on by the Ohio Debate Commission, because those topics that you mentioned are all topics that might come before the court as cases in controversy and therefore, ethically, it's not possible for them to uh, really give their opinion. It would be like prejudging the issue before it came forward and it then be uh, stuck with those answers when uh, they came in front of uh, two parties who were litigating the issue. Now, I have to confess, I was not able to hear Judge Adrian, but I'm going to ask uh, both of our other justices. Uh, Justice McGee Brown, why don't you go ahead and... Uh, kind of explain a little bit more about some of the background of this and why we can't talk to the judges and the candidates about their positions on things that might come before the court. The reality is, is that you want judges and judges do come to the bench making their decisions based on what the law and the constitution requires. And so hearing their personal views can give people the perception that a judge is going to rule based on their personal views, not based on what the law and the constitution requires. And so the judicial uh, rules that govern judges are very clear that as a jurist, your personal opinions cannot come into how you rule on the case. And that's why you see candidates and those currently sitting on the bench being so careful with how they respond to any question that might seem to forecast how they might rule on a particular issue. All right, great. I think I fixed some of my technical issues, though I'm having a little problem with my camera here. Uh, Justice Lanzinger, you want to weigh in? that this is the frustrating part for voters. On the one hand, you're told you want to choose the person that you wish to serve on the Supreme Court. And yet on the other hand, you can't ask the judge what he or she is going to do once they get there. So it is a frustrating thing. In fact, the whole forum could have been frustrating for
people. I think just, there you go. Judy, I think we lost you. Yeah, go ahead. Repeat the last one. I was going to say, and that's why it makes it difficult for people to know which person to choose because they have not been able to answer certain questions. Um, that gets into the whole problem of should we elect judges at the Supreme Court level? Or should we do something else? And I want to get to that because uh, it's a really interesting point. Let's talk a little bit about one of the things that did come up in the forum, though, the idea of judicial restraint. That phrase was mentioned about five times. In one <laughs> reference, there was the reference to judicial restraint and its evil twin judicial activism. What does that mean in layman's terms? And I just want to throw that out there and whoever would like to answer, go right ahead. You know, I often say that judicial restraint and judicial activism depends on where you come down on the issue being decided. And so, I mean, the reality is, is all judges, when they take the oath, take an oath to decide cases based on the facts and the law. And whichever side loses accuses the judge or the court of being an activist court. The reality is, is that jurists come and they bring who they are, their understanding, they're reading the statute and they're using their brain to interpret the statute and the law. And anybody who thinks that we leave all those personal things at the door uh, when we put on the robe and climb on the bench is uh, sadly mistaken. Those things are, are present. You have to guard against bringing them into the case that's in front of you. But, uh, you know, this question of judicial restraint versus judicial act uh, uh, activism is something that's been debated hotly for many years and it's been taken up uh, by politicians to try to paint people who don't hold the same views as they uh, as being something that's that's uh, anathema. I mean, there, and there's a difference really between judicial activism and judicial advocacy. And I think that one of the things that that uh, was on display during the course of the debate were those who think that they are totally constrained uh, by the language that's contained in the Constitution and the statutes and those who believe that it's their responsibility to uh, interpret that to meet uh, current events, that we're not stuck in the, the 18th century as it relates to what we do when we look at the law. Right. Karen, I think one of the things we should mention is the focus on overruling uh, the legislature based on the Constitution. That is a component of court does, but there are many cases that come before the Supreme Court that might not have constitutional issues per se. They're a matter of looking at the statute that was created by the General Assembly and deciding uh, which way to rule, one way or the other. Uh, someone mentioned that there are briefs that the court has to look at, and that's true. Two, two parties or sometimes more uh, might file a brief that is a written uh, document with the court uh, to look at and to decide based on the position that's stated in that record, should we rule this way, should we rule that way? And although it seems to be kind of a binary decision where you're, as, as someone put it, calling balls and strikes, I think it, it's a little bit different than that. It's a little more complicated than that because many times the court is not going to have precedent to follow. And that is the problem with uh, saying, I'm going to follow the law. Sometimes it's not clear what the law is in a particular case, and that's for the justices to decide. I think that's where you get into the whole question of our, you hear the phrase legislating from the bench, but then there are people who will point out that when there isn't precedent, that it was a, a court that made a ruling to desegregate schools or, or to, to move forward in the absence of a law, right? Right. And can I give you a perfect example? So recently, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that sexual orientation was protected by Title VII. The day after that decision, um, Senator Kennedy from the state of Louisiana 
was grilling uh, judicial nominees saying, so how do you interpret a statute? Do you interpret it based on the words in the statute or the words as they were written by the drafters? And the, the candidates who were appearing for federal judicial seats kept saying, well, I read the words and I interpret them with the common meaning of the words. And Justice Kennedy said the common meaning today or the common meaning when they were written. It gets into a level of absurdity. This, the words have meaning and judges apply the meaning. And I think everybody was shocked that a couple of uh, strict constructionist judges on the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on a, differently in a matter than the public or the senators were expecting. That's when it gets to be absurd. I want to ask about uh, Justice Lansinger. You brought up the whole idea of balls and strikes, and and that's a phrase that uh, Justice Judy French has used a couple mm -hmm. of times, saying that she is uh, an umpire here to call balls and strikes. How do you feel about that statement? Is a justice, is a judge, an umpire, or is there more to the role than just calling what you see like that? Well, the first person who used that analogy, really, that I'm aware of is Justice Roberts of the U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice. He used that that comment to say, you know, I have a, a limited role. I have a limited view of what judges are to do. But I, I don't know that you can really say that's that's the case. If If it applies anywhere, it probably applies more in the trial court when the trial court is deciding whether um, a rule of evidence applies, if someone should testify or not, if someone has a privilege or not, if an objection should be uh, granted or not. Those are decisions that are yes, no, on, off, in, out. But when you're talking about uh, the interpretation of a statute, you are talking about a, a plethora of of issues and ideas and viewpoints that you have to look at. And it's much more complicated than uh, the umpire in a sports uh, game, for example. Uh, very, very different. So I guess my view is there's a, there's a, a, a reason to use the metaphor in, in a certain limited uh, area, but not, not really for what a, a Supreme Court justice does on a day-to-day -day basis. But it doesn't really translate easily, in that metaphor. Because even at the trial court level, you know, the way that you come down on the interpretation of, of, the, uh, of a particular statute has a lot to do with the facts of the individual case. And so whereas you might nine times out of 10 rule in one way, on that 10th occasion, there may be something in there or the argument that's presented to you by the advocate might be strong enough to make you reconsider the way that you've interpreted the law up until that point and come at it from a different direction uh, that may be radically different, but may be uh, the right interpretation for the time and the facts. Right. Justice McGee Brown, you want to weigh in? No, I, I completely agree with that. I often say to high school students that you know, the Constitution that was created by the framers is beautiful in its simplicity. And it's why it survived 240 years is that it has allowed us to interpret it as the country has in the times, quite honestly, have moved forward. As voters are trying to figure out who they want to cast their ballots for in the Supreme Court race, these races are nonpartisan. There's no R or D after the candidate's name. But as former Ohio Democratic Party chair Chris Redfern told me, these are very partisan races. And he blames the fact that there isn't an R or D after the, the candidate's names uh, based on, he says, archaic state laws. Why are these not identified as partisan races when clearly the parties do promote the candidates who are running? And, and there's, there's a, a partisan history with some of these folks. Mm -hmm. You got, I mean, <laughs> I, it's a system that has evolved over time. I don't know that I agree with it. I think that candidates are endorsed by their parties. They attend partisan events. Having an R or a D by their name just simply says who's endorsing them as with every other candidate. But mm -hmm. that's the rules that we have. Right. And it's really a farce. You know, I mean, you know, you run in a, in a, partisan primary. And then when you get to the general election, you run nonpartisan. Ohio is the only state in the nation that has the configuration 
that we have. And it, it doesn't make any sense uh, if you're going to have people running for election for them uh, not to be delineated, you know, all the way through as what they are. People are going to get a, a good idea. And the ones that don't uh, have an idea really haven't been paying attention. Right. The party is important because it allows you to get onto the ballot. Um, when you talk about eight, eight, eight million potential voters in the state of Ohio and 88 counties, and you're running statewide uh, for, for the Supreme Court, you need to have the um, support of an institution behind you to get to get onto the ballot. But really, I think one of the candidates mentioned when when uh, they attend a meeting, the idea is not to uh, say that you're going to do something in return for all of this support. I mean, it's, it's an interesting situation to be put into when you're an independent person and you're an independent in your heart, you attempt to be, and you certainly want to do that on the bench when you get there. But to say, I want your support, um, I appreciate everything you're doing for me, but I'm not making any promises about how I'm going to rule uh, once I get to the bench. And I'm glad you brought that up because I asked both the incumbents in the race, Justice French and uh, Justice Kennedy, about their appearances at partisan events. And they both said that that's appropriate because they're there to talk about the role of the judiciary in the three branches of government and, and not as a representative of a party or a platform. But I want to ask you folks, in a nonpartisan race, which is what this is supposed to be, is that appropriate to appear at partisan events? Well, I think the whole thing of saying, well, yes, it's appropriate to appear. You're, you've been endorsed by your party. I think the misnomer, as Judge Adrian pointed out, is we say that candidates are a they're endorsed by their party, but suddenly when the race comes up, the election, they're quote, nonpartisan. I agree that judges should not be making decisions based on a party platform, but to say that they are not Democrats or Republicans is really kind of ridiculous. I mean, they're showing up at these parties to get support, to get people to vote for them. And there is a perception that if you are a Republican or a Democrat, you share the beliefs of that party. Now, how that factors in to how you ultimately rule, we know is not always consistent because the facts and the law don't always present themselves in a neat way that you're kind of expressing some ideology, nor should you be. Mm -hmm. But what about uh, appearing in events? For instance, Justice Kennedy had gotten some heat for appearing at an event uh, sponsored by Greater Toledo Right to Life right before a case involving a Toledo abortion mm -hmm. clinic came before the court. Is that appropriate? Well, from my perspective, uh, no, that's, that's not appropriate because again, it raises the perception that somehow or another you favor one uh, point of view or another. And those kinds of events, we're instructed uh, when we take our ethical courses that you're supposed to avoid those types of events uh, because of the fact that, that you have an obligation to avoid the perception, not the reality necessarily, but the perception that you've already decided an issue that's likely to come in front of you. And that one is probably the hottest potato that we have. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you all, uh, as people have been watching the Supreme Court hearings the before Congress or before the Senate uh, for Amy Coney Barrett, uh, there are candidates who have come before the senators and have made public statements on issues, but then when asked, they don't respond. They they kind of hide back and stand back and say that they, they aren't there to talk about that. They're there to talk about other Supreme Court related issues. Is that appropriate? I mean, when you've got a candidate in front of you who has signed a pledge or done something that's specifically public on an issue that may come before the court, is it appropriate to ask about that? You know, Karen, that's a real interesting situation because, you know, you have you have the canon, which can be used in a, in a sense as a shield for a, a justice or a judge who doesn't want to respond to a specific issue. Uh, because of the questioner who is asking the question. It's interesting that 
sometimes, depending on the type of question that's asked, the candidate may be very voluble and very willing to answer. And yet, if it's another person asking, uh, all of a sudden there's a pullback, you know, and I guess it's, it's human nature to do that. You want to present yourself in the best light, but there is a tension here. We have as, as candidates, as a candidate for election, you have the right to free speech in a sense. And yet there's a muzzle that's put on the judges under the canons, which say, because of the very, uh, Com very good comments that um, Judge Adrian was making about the perception. There are very good reasons for uh, the rules to be there to say, we don't want you taking a position on certain issues because people are going to feel that if they walk into the courtroom and they have the opposing view, they aren't going to be treated fairly. I do think that, though, there, that, as you said, that they use it as a shield. I think there's a way to respond as a person without giving an indication of how you might rule. So, for example, using Judge Barrett, when she was asked, did she think it was wrong to separate mothers and children at the border? I can understand why that might be uncomfortable given who is nominating her for the Supreme Court. But an appropriate answer could certainly have been, as a mother, I think that it's inappropriate or horrible to separate children from their mother. That is different from whether there is the legal authority to do so. And when I am, if I'm confirmed to the bench, I will make my decision based on what the law and the authority of the president are in determining my decision. I think allowing people to see that you are a human is okay. When I was a juvenile court judge, I would go out and speak all the time about what happens to children to get them into the juvenile court. That didn't mean that I was giving anybody a pass for crimes they committed, but just understanding how this happened. And I think that that's an appropriate balance, but obviously it's easier just to say, I can't say anything. Right. But I think it's unreasonable for us to believe that people are being appointed to a position on the Supreme Court and that they didn't get that appointment because of things that they've already done and said that clearly, you know, set forth exactly where they're, they're coming from. They're, they're not blank slates. If, if I, uh, the current nominee had not made a lot of statements about uh, the things that are likely to come before her uh, in her opinions and also in just her writings. There's no way in the world that she would have been nominated to the uh, U.S. Supreme Court by this president. Right. And just a reminder for those who want to join us via text or on Twitter, if you have questions for any of our distinguished judges, you can text them to 330-541-541. 5794. You can also tweet them at City Club and we will work them in. Before we go to a couple, and we do have some, I just want to do some constructive criticism here. As one of the moderators, as one of the people who helped put together the questions, I'd like to know from you folks, did the forum have value in terms of how you would look at how to judge the judges? How can you judge? Were you able to judge how the judges would exercise judgment in a sense? Did, did you get anything out of that? No. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Let me start with saying that it was so important to have this forum because it's the first time that you had all four candidates in one uh, virtual venue, although they were not together, and maybe that was part of the part of the difficulty. But there were so many things that um, maybe could have uh, been asked that that weren't. Uh, for example, the, the point of collegiality for the Supreme Court is so is just crucial. And I, I think there were a couple of allusions to working together, but that is so important. We talk about the balls and strikes on the one hand, the metaphor. I'd say, you know, the metaphor that I would like to think of for the Supreme Court is a group of very wise individuals from diverse backgrounds coming together looking at the facts of the particular case, looking at the law that was presented, 
having a discussion, a full discussion where each, each individual is listening and collaborating and coming to a decision and writing an opinion that will be understandable to all. Now, I don't think that a lot of people realize that's where the work is done and that's how the work is presented to the public. We don't take, uh, we did not take uh, hear hearings, we did not have a trial, we didn't have various individuals in front of us. You have at least two lawyers arguing and then the deliberations and then the opinion. So, you know, the idea of the process might have been um, a little more explained and yet we still have the problems with distinguishing among the candidates that I mentioned earlier. And I don't think that it was clear, and, and I don't say this is a fault, but I just think that all of the answers were very safe. And I don't know that the public realizes that in a state that goes 50-50 every presidential year, that you know six of the seven Supreme Court justices are all Republican. And I kept hearing the two incumbent justices kept talking about the stability of the court. Well, stability means we don't change. <laughs> and that's that's really nice to have have that because if I'm an incumbent, I want that too. I want stability. I don't want you to, to change. But I, I do think that we should point out more to the voters that this is a very diverse state and to not have that diversity of thought on the court just in terms of different um, representation, I think is an issue. And, and we have made some progress in that there are now two uh, Democrats. That's right. I'm sorry, two, yeah. uh, And I guess I see that as progress. Some people might not, but, <laughs> uh, but you know, one of the things that I, you know, and I agree with Yvette's one word summation about uh, did they get, did, did we get what we needed? I didn't think that we really did either, uh, because there's a lot of things that that the justices of the Supreme Court do that don't have anything to do with what they do from the bench. Now, for instance, you know, I I had the the honor of chairing the Ohio Commission on Racial Fairness back in the '90s. That commission uh, produced a report that had some 68 or so recommendations. Uh, for the courts of the state of Ohio. The Supreme Court in its supervisory role certainly has the ability to implement or see that those kind of recommendations get implemented, but the vast majority of them uh, have just been gathering uh, dust. Uh, we could have gone into that and a number of other kind of supervisory things that the Ohio Supreme Court uh, could do in order to improve the administration of justice and that don't have anything to do with the cases that they rule on. And although we don't have a strong chief justice system where the chief can actually tell people exactly what they should do, when you get an edict from the Supreme Court saying, uh, this is the direction that your courts need to be looking at going, uh, that's a strong imperative for uh, appellate court judges and, and trial court judges to take a hard look at the business that they're doing. And we could have asked them about those things. We've gotten a couple of questions here, and I want to go to one of them since Justice McGee, McGee Brown, you just talked about this just a moment ago. So I want to ask about this. Uh, and I did ask uh, the incumbents, Judy French and Sharon Kennedy, about this. The Ohio Business Roundtable, its CEO had put out a call to CEOs to uh, suggest that they tell their employees that the election of conservative justices would help with court stability and, and maybe their jobs. So the question comes, I'm curious to hear what the panelists thought of the Ohio Business Roundtable's efforts to encourage support of the incumbents. So I think it would be disingenuous to say that all of the groups that endorse judicial candidates don't do the same, right? The FOP does, teachers do, firefighters do, medical association does, the bar association does. Where I think there's room for criticism with the Ohio Business Roundtable is that when a CEO sends an email to their employees about who to vote for, there is more of a corrosive effect. If it were just like the company's political action committee saying, these are the candidates we have supported as the political action committee of this company, I see that as different than a direct email from a CEO to their employees. 
Yeah, and it's more than just corrosive. It's also extremely coercive. You know, that, that you know, when you get a letter from the boss saying, you know, this is what you need to do, uh, although all of us vote uh, privately, you know, there's a, a, a level of coercion that I think that uh, follows that, that makes that very, very wrong and wrong headed for that CEO to do. I should say that uh, Justice French did answer saying that she supports that effort because stability on the court is good, but stability on the court means she gets reelected. So it would stand a reason that she would support that there would be stability on the court. Let me move to another question here. And, and we talked about this, I think, briefly, but I want to build on this. If we could start from scratch, how would the panelists build the system for putting people on the bench in Ohio? And we've all kind of hinted at if election of judges is the right way to go. So let me ask you folks, is the election of justices the right way to go? And if not, what would you do? One, one thing that I think might be helpful, at least if you're talking, if you're talking about the Supreme Court level, is up the qualifications needed. Right now, people don't realize uh, someone who graduated from law school and was a lawyer for six years could uh, theoretically run for the Supreme Court because that's all the qualifications that are needed by statute. Um, if we had a situation that would look at, say, previous legal experience, and not, not that everybody would have to be a judge, but so many more years in practice, um, and potentially even have uh, qualifications that looked at, at the educational background in terms of additional courses that would lead to someone who would have the ability to be a, a neutral um, individual that has the ability to uh, move from advocacy into uh, judgment and, and judicial activity. That might be helpful. But I think right now you don't, you don't need those things. And really you go to school after you become a judge to learn how to be a judge. And that's kind of a strange situation. Um, a lot of different countries have individuals who are tracked to become judges. They learn uh, early on the, the qualities that make a good judge. But we have you become an advocate for only six years and then you can move into the judiciary. So it would change the pool, the initial pool available for uh, running if we kept the election. I think no system is perfect. Other states have systems where there's a governor appointment, then there's a retention election. Um, the problem with that is that with retention elections, sometimes very bad judges or poorly performing judges stay in office. Or you have the situation which happened in Iowa probably 10 years ago where the Supreme Court came out in favor of same-sex marriage and there was a huge petition to remove three of those justices from the bench. So there, there's really no perfect system, whether you have, the only perfect system would be to do it as the federal system has done it, where you'd have a governor's appointment, a general Senate confirmation, and then an appointment for a term of years. You could look at something like that. But the reality is, I think once you've given people the right to vote for judges, even though they're not sure who they're voting for, you're never going to take that mm -hmm. right away. What I would implore the parties to do, and I think for those of us who are lawyers and judges in the party, to work with the parties on who they nominate, because we should help them nominate qualified people for the bench at all levels and stop playing this name game that I think does a disservice to many of the people who are working hard in the judiciary. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. There's, there's no way for you to get politics out of this selection process. No matter what uh, you do, if you've got elected judges or if you have judicial officers who are appointed by the governor, you know, you know, and he gets five uh, potential candidates as it relates to um, any given seat. The problem is that in the five selections that he's gotten, you can believe that somebody that he wants to appoint gets in that five and oh, lo and behold, that individual is the person who ends up getting selected. So there is no perfect 
uh, process, giving people the right to vote uh, for judges, as far as I'm concerned, is is not uh, the best or the optimal system. Uh, because people, when they exercise that, exercise it with absolutely uh, zero uh, thought process. It's total ignorance. And so, but if you put in, as Je uh, Justice Lansinger said, uh, some additional criteria as to uh, who gets selected, you may not raise the ceiling, but you certainly could raise the floor as it relates to who makes the bench. And I think that that's uh, the most important thing that possibly could be made. We've had two attempts uh, to change our current system of electing judges to a, one that was merit-based, and both of those went down screaming in flames. And it's not likely that the citizens of Ohio are in any time soon going to change the current structure. Yeah, I believe that was an effort that uh, uh, the late Chief Justice Moyer had wanted to see happen. Yeah. Thomas Moyer had wanted to see happen as a mm -hmm. merit selection of judges. But while we talk, or justices rather, while we talk about getting politics out and whether that's even possible, I think we have to talk about the role of money now in Supreme Court races. Each of these candidates who are on the ballot this time have raised at least a half a million dollars this year. How does my, that kind of money in a Supreme Court race change the race or does it? Yeah, I mean, it definitely changes the race. Mm -hmm. I mean, the more money comes in, you know, money has a, has a, a again, a corruptive impact on things. And for uh, judges to say that, you know, uh, when they've received uh, a unbelievable amount of money from certain people who uh, advocate a particular position, uh, and people on the other side haven't given them any money at all for for them to say that that doesn't have any impact on them. I think just uh, defies common sense and human nature. I don't know that I believe with that last part, Ron. I'm I'm going to push back a little on you because judges only you know in Ohio we have contribution limits, and so why the total amount. A half million dollars raised by a candidate may seem large to the general public. The governor's races and statewide candidates raise in the tens of millions of dollars. And so by comparison for a state as large as Ohio, the Supreme Court candidates raise a very small amount. And it's solely to be able to get on TV across this huge state. But I don't think somebody, I think the limit now is around thirteen or $1,400 to a, a judicial candidate for the Supreme Court, I don't believe that that in and of itself is corrosive. I do think, you know, you have all of these independent expenditure groups. That's where the perception comes in when you have them vying for how much money they spend on a Supreme Court race. I think the public has a right to say, wait a minute, why are they so interested in who this candidate is? And that was my point. Right. Uh, one of the questions, and Justice Lanzinger, you talked about this, collegiality. And so there's a question here about in what ways is political balance on a high court good for democracy? Are there times when less balance is better? I kind of think of that gets into that question about collegiality and the fact that if indeed two Democrats win in this election, there'll be a Democratic majority on the Ohio Supreme Court for the first time since 1993, a very short period during that year. What about that? You know, that that perception, and I think uh, Judge Adrian mentioned, you know, perception isn't necessarily reality, but it's it's something that people think about. And so the idea is, okay, if there's a 5-4, or excuse me, a 4-3 balance, it's a balance of, of party. And yet, if you have been in any of the deliberations, and I was a, a, on the Supreme Court for 12 years, I, I can't think of any maybe one or two situations where the issue of party may have been raised and that may have been because we were talking about um, the legislature and the governor cases that perhaps, but generally speaking, the idea of party was not uh, a driving force. Now, certainly there were issues of personality and there were issues of, well, I know this justice T tends to lean this way in this type of case. This justice may have this perception. So, so you have the diversity in thought and the diversity of approaching cases. 
And that is what I say is so important for us. I would agree with, um, with Yvette that it's so important to have a, a view of the entire state. I mean, if we could have uh, different, different viewpoints, different experiences to bring to the court and to, to discuss these cases uh, carefully and then come to a decision that the, part, the, um, the ordinary person could look at and say, well, they all agreed on this. It must be, it must be a, a good law um, because we, have, we don't have just one, one viewpoint. We have a variety of viewpoints coming to this decision. Anybody else want to weigh in? Please do. No, I, well, I agree. I had the privilege of serving with Judy. We had a female majority. We used to tease the guys that we were going to go, go off and make a decision without them. But I think collegiality goes more to the person than the party. It's really about what people bring to the table, how they make decisions. We would have vigorous debates over legal issues, not over partisan issues. But at the end of the conference, we all were friends. We would leave and go out to dinner or go back to our families. It never felt personal. And I, I think that was because of the people sitting around the table, not necessarily their party. Right. And, and I've been on the uh, municipal court bench and have been in situations where we had individuals who were uh, personally uh, fairly outrageous. And it has a really detrimental uh, impact on the actually day-to-day -day running of the court, not so much as it relates to the decisions that are made because we're not required at the trial court level to come to consensus on individual issues that might arise. But as it relates to the administration of the court and therefore the administration of justice within a jurisdiction, if you don't have people who can get along with each other, uh, the probabilities are great that uh, your court is not going to operate at a level that that is in the most ways beneficial for uh, do, doing what the people who elected us uh, there uh, would think would be the most uh, useful for what they need. Right. We look at uh, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia. Uh, on the federal level as a, as an example of individuals who personally got along well and yet professionally were on different different sides and different methods of uh, looking at cases. And yet th that court occasionally did come to a unanimous decision. So it can be done. It can be done. I think that most people don't know that the overwhelming majority of U.S. Supreme Court decisions are unanimous. It's just those few hot button cases that seem to to divide along um, ideological lines, although you've got Chief Justice Roberts as Chief Justice Kennedy and then even uh, Chief or uh, Justice Gorsuch, who have come up with surprising opinions based on what the issue was and the laws they interpret it. And I think that's what you want. Right. I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, if you didn't, if it wasn't that way, then you could just put a robot in place and that robot would rule all the time uh, along the way that it was programmed uh, to, to handle for certain kinds of facts. So the fact that we uh, elect individuals or we appoint individuals just presupposes that we want them to bring their experience, their education, um, all of the things that make them who they are to every issue that they decide. And as Yvette was pointing out, you know, the vast majority of decisions at the U.S. Supreme Court level are uh, decided unanimously or if not unanimously with a well, what we would consider to be a super majority. It's just mm -hmm. those few that make the press, they're the only ones that are newsworthy and those are the ones that we make decisions of, uh, about the court and about the justices of court. Right. That's really interesting because I think a lot of people don't know that because it yeah. is usually a divided court. That's the stories that we hear. I wanna go back to an audience question here. Is Ohio served or not served by the mandatory retirement age for Ohio judges and justices? <laughs> 
We are not served. <laughs> And Judge Adrian would still be on the court. Well, the reality is we're all living longer, right? And so it's it's amazing to me that two people running for president of the United States are in their late 70s. And yet in Ohio, you cease being a judge in the year you turn 70. Mm -hmm. That is crazy to me because people are healthy. We're living longer. I think having that judicial age is just wrong. Yeah. Well, I could respond to that. I could respond to that, but I have personal (laughs) (laughs) I would have probably been running in, in 16 if I could have done so. But. Yeah. You know, I, I came off the bench uh, at the end of 17 uh, because I'd reached mandatory retirement age. And, um, you know, I uh, on the one hand, I, I think that it makes absolute sense uh, for us to at least check to make sure the people who have become superannuated still have what it takes to hold the bench. But I know a lot of people who have gotten to uh, the point where they're forced to retire and they are way better than some 30 year olds mm-hmm. who got there because of the fact that they put in their six years and they had a good running name. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's an arbitrary metric to use uh, to take people off. But again, uh, there was an uh, initiative that was put before the people of the state of Ohio as to whether or not it should continue on and uh, it got crushed. So it is what it is. And sometimes I think, in, you know, it, it makes uh, it, it makes sense to recognize that it is possible to stay too long at the party. And you, you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to vote them. <laughs> We're coming down toward the end here, but uh, another audience question. What's the difference between case law and statutory law and why does it matter? Um, So the statutes are what the legislature passes and then the case law is what the court determines those statutes mean and having precedent is how a court operates. You don't want a court, as as we heard Chief Justice Roberts say recently, simply changing because the membership of the court changes. And so it's very important that you have case law precedent, again, for predictability, for stability. People want to know what the rules are and those rules shouldn't change based on the judicial makeup of the court, but should be based on the precedent, how the court has decided cases, and change should be incremental and slow to allow for predictability. Right, and at the Supreme Court level, if the justices have decided a case, that becomes the um, the guidepost for all the judges in the state of Ohio. They are also bound by the same precedent. So it's not just a, a situation that the court is ruling solely for the Supreme Court. We're ruling for all of the judges within the state. You got to think that that courts are really constructed and their primary role is in in most instances to maintain the status quo because people depend upon uh, what the law has been in order to know what they're supposed to do moving forward. And it's only in those rare instances where somebody looks back at uh, a precedent that's been in place for a long period of time and uh, based upon a change in circumstances basically on the ground. And this goes back to this, that question about laws and strikes and judicial restraint. But there are instances that arise where, you know, it is absolutely necessary that precedent be uh, discarded. And uh, you, you think that that would only come about in those instances where there is a, uh, like with board of, uh, you know, um, the board, the speaker versus the board of education. Um, you know, well, I've gotten it wrong, but uh, the uh, board case that um, that the what had been in place for many, many years and decades was clearly uh, not. Uh, something that should continue past that point. And so uh, the chief justice in that case made sure that when they changed that super precedent, that it was done with a 9-0 opinion of the 
Supreme Court to say, we all agree that this has to change. Mm -hmm. Now, I just have the out for the listeners, though, the viewers. When they did that, Brown versus Board of Education, they did it based on the law in front of them, right? Because when the court had decided in Plessy versus Ferguson that separate but equal was the law of the land, it was in, in 1954 with Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund had shown that separate was not equal. So it wasn't just the court deciding on its own, we're gonna change this. The court had before it evidence that in fact separate was not equal, which allowed them then to change the law. So again, they didn't act as politicians, they acted based on the